All right, everyone. Hello. Thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us. My name is Dion Rossiter, and I am the executive director of Science at Cal, one of the co-hosts of today's program, along with Berkeley Lab. Again, thank you for joining us for Midday Science Cafe, um, adapting to change the future of California's water energy nexus, featuring Julia Sinai and Jennifer Stokes drought. It is so exciting to be here for our April events. So thank you so much. Just to give you a little bit of background. Oh, I'm going to start with our land acknowledgement. Excuse me. <laughs> um, I just want to say, Berkeley would like to say that we recognize that Berkeley sits on the Huchun territory, the ancestral and unceded land of the Ohlone people, the successors of the historic and sovereign Verona band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone tribe and other familial descendants of the Verona band. Every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. By offering this land acknowledgement, the Berkeley community not only recognizes the history of the land on which we stand, but also recognizes that the Ohlone people are alive and flourishing members of the Berkeley and broader Bay Area communities today. So thank you so much for allowing me to take a moment to acknowledge the land that we are on. So back to science at Cal, um, we celebrate science through public programming. Typically we are live and in person on campus, in the community, at festivals, at cafes, at coffee shops, at restaurants, um, giving lectures and hands-on activities, bringing Cal scientists to the Berkeley and broader East Bay communities. Um, we partner with a whole slew of, of um, folks across the community, and we'd love to see you at our events when we hopefully soon enough go live again. But again, thank you for joining us um, during the shelter in place and pandemic. Um, you can find us on online, on the web, on every social media platform you could think of, um, typically at science at Cal and on email. Before I introduce uh, Berkeley Lab, I just wanted to take a moment to say uh, we will go through each one of our speakers. We will have a short Q&A between each speaker. So please remember to continue to add your questions into the chat box and we'll get those answered. All of our questions will be answered today by our speakers, um, either at the short Q&A between the talks or if at the very end, we will come all together and we will, um, again, make sure we get to all of your questions. So there's a Q&A box and there's also the chat box. We'll take questions from both. Um, and I um, want to also mention that this event, this uh, both of these lectures will be online very soon after the event. Maybe give us a few days and we'll, we'll get them on the YouTube and we'll also email everyone a link to the recording if you'd like to share it with your friends, please do. So without further ado, I'm gonna welcome Jen Tang up to uh, introduce uh, Berkeley Lab. Hi, Jen. Hey, Dee. Thanks so much for the introduction. Uh, I, as Dee mentioned, am the Director for Federal and Community Relations at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. And for those who are new to the lab, to give you some context, Berkeley Lab is one of 17 U.S. Department of Energy national laboratories across the country. We're supported by the Department of Energy's Office of Science and are managed by the University of California. All of the research that we conduct at the lab is unclassified. So since our founding in 1931 by a UC Berkeley professor named Ernest Orlando Lawrence, Berkeley Lab has been dedicated to advancing the scope of human knowledge and seeking science solutions to some of the greatest problems facing humankind. And for those doing the math, this is actually the lab's 90th anniversary. And as we celebrate our past achievements and imagine what discoveries the next 90 years might bring, we hope you'll visit our 90th anniversary website page. It's berkeleylabnext90.lbl.gov, and I'll put that in the chat box. We've got a number of features and opportunities to engage with us, including an upcoming lecture on Friday, April 30th, about negative emissions technologies, which remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere or other sources, and will help meet the ambitious plans the Biden administration has set forth to tackle climate, the climate crisis. Uh, today, Berkeley Lab researchers develop sustainable energy and environmental solutions. We create useful new materials and we advance the frontiers of computing, 
and probe the mysteries of life, matter, and the universe. Our main campus is nestled in the Berkeley Hills above the UC Berkeley campus. And we employ about 4,000 people, about 1,700 of whom are scientists and engineers and faculty members. More than 500 of our employees are undergraduates and graduate students. And these are scientists who are just beginning their research journey. Now, Berkeley Lab's proximity to Cal and our close ties to the UC system create a really unique and synergistic environment for scientific discovery. A number of the lab's researchers are affiliated with one of the UC campuses as either students, postdocs, or professors and have joint appointments at the lab. Now, as you can imagine, our relationship with the UC Berkeley campus is especially close, and our institutions have joined forces to advance science across a number of different frontiers. One of the main motivations for creating our Midday Science Cafe series is to share with you examples of compelling and complementary scientific research that both our institutions are investigating. So we hope you enjoy today's presentation on the energy water nexus. With that, Dee, let me turn it back to you. Thanks, Jen. And what I'm going to do next is I am going to introduce our second Jen of the night, of the, of the day, I should say. It's not evening just yet. Um, and I will go ahead and let her share her screen and give her a little bit of an introduction. Introduction, excuse me. So Jennifer uh, Stokes Drought conducts research on the economic, energy, and environmental implications of complex infrastructure systems at Lawrence Berkeley Lab and at UC Berkeley. Um, so she's both. She's a friend of both. Thank you for being here. She focuses primarily on innovative and integrative, integrated water systems, specifically evaluating trade-offs and synergies between different water-related functions, including conveyance, treatment, and management of potable water, recycled water, wastewater, and stormwater throughout the economy. Lots of different kinds of water. Um, she is also interested in understanding their interdependencies with other economic sectors, uh, for example, energy and food, and how they will be affected by our climate, by our changing climate. She is currently serving as the deputy lead for the National Alliance for Water Innovation uh, integrated Data and Analysis Research. Jen has a BS from the Georgia Institute of Technology and a master's and PhD um, from UC Berkeley in civil and environmental engineering. So it is so excited to have, I'm so excited to have Jen with us. I'm so excited to hear your talk. So take it away, Jen. Oops, you're muted, Jen. Ah, man, it happens all the I time. I know, classic, classic, but Sorry. we're so forgiving. No worries. I, know. <laughs> I was so ready to get started. Um, today, we're going to be talking about the interconnections or the nexus between the water and energy systems that we rely on every day. And we're going to set our discussion in the context of California, because both Julie and I are here, obviously, as representatives of the UC system. Um, in this first talk, I am going to focus on, why is it, aren't my slides advancing? Can these hold for a moment? Huh. Did that work? Yes. I'm going to be focusing on these um, areas shown with a blue star, which represent the urban water sector. And this is the infrastructure it takes us to obtain and treat the water we use for drinking and other, other purposes in our homes, for example as well as the wastewater infrastructure that we rely on to collect that water after we've used it and then treat it so it's safe for discharge or reuse. Julia then is gonna follow up with more information on those systems, as well as some discussion of water use for agriculture and energy production. And then she's also gonna discuss how we might expect those systems to change as our climate changes in the future. So we're gonna start my portion of the talk with a few statistics. How much of the electricity that we generate is actually used by these water and wastewater utilities in our cities that I just discussed? The answer, if we look globally, is that we use 4% of our electricity for these services. In the US specifically, the number is considerably lower. It's only 1.5%. This is not because our systems are that much more efficient. It's really because we use a lot of electricity for other purposes. Um, but in California, 
however, the number is much higher. We use 5% of our electricity for these water and wastewater utility services. Um, and in fact, that's only part of the story. Um, in fact, Californians use three times more electricity to manage water inside their homes and businesses, mostly for heating and cooling, than we do to get water to our homes. So the total water-related electricity used in California is more like 20% of our, of our total generation. And this may surprise you that we are three times um, higher electricity use than the US average, because we think of ourselves, our Californians, and especially those of us in Berkeley, we think of ourselves as being very water conscious and energy conscious and also environmentally conscious compared to perhaps the average American. And that may lead you to the next question of why? And the answer is actually very simple. We have to match supply and demand. So if you look at weather statistics in the US on average, this figure shows you some statistics. The blue bars indicate how much precipitation is falling in a given month, either as rain or snow. And the orange line tells you the maximum daily temperature that's occurring in that month. So across the US, what we typically see is we get more rain and snow, well not snow, but more rain in the summer when we need more water because we are, um, cooling our homes or watering our gardens or our lawns or drinking more because it's hot. But in California, if you spent any time in the state, you've probably realized we have the exact opposite pattern in our precipitation. We get little to no precipitation in our hottest months when, our, when we need it the most. And so we have to figure out how to get water at the times that we need it. It's a little bit more, amp the problem is amplified because we almost never have what we refer to as an average year. We have very much a feast or famine situation in water in California. So much so that in recent, in recent history, we had a period in 2016 where every county in the state was in a state of drought emergency. And the very next year in 2017, almost every county in the state was in a state of flood emergency. So we really um, bounce back and forth between extremes quite often. On top of those mismatches in time, we often don't have water in the places where we need it. So this um, figure shows you the distribution of precipitation across the state, and it varies considerably, so much so that these orange areas represent some of the driest places in North America, and the dark blue in our northeast corner is about one and a half times the precipitation that falls in the Amazon rainforest on average. So that's a lot of variation. And it's made worse because if you drew a line a third of the way across the state, just north of Sacramento, you would expect to get more than 75% of the precipitation falling above that line and more than 75% of our demand for water for people, farms, and businesses occurring below that line. So we have to figure out how to get water in the times and in the places where we most need it under these challenging circumstances. And the way we've done that historically is by relying on really big infrastructure that we built throughout the 1900s. So this map shows you that infrastructure. The squares are reservoirs that store water that falls in our wet times, so it's available in our dry times. And on top of all of these reservoirs that you see here, we also rely on the snowpack in our mountainous areas to store about a third of our water supply in the winter and spring, historically speaking. This is a little bit of a teaser because Julie is gonna talk more about that snowpack later. Um, the bold lines on the map are the canals and aqueducts that we use to move water hundreds of miles, and in some cases to pump water literally over mountains to get it to where it's needed. And that takes a lot of energy. Um, it was very expensive to build these systems, and it was a collaborative effort between local, state, and federal agencies, which is indicated by the color coding on the map. There are some challenges with these systems. Um, a big one is that all of the water that we move from north and south has to move through this bottleneck area that we call the California Delta. It's where the Sacramento River and the San Joaquin River meet up and flow out through the San Francisco Bay. It's just east of Berkeley. Um, and the water exported from this region um, serves 25 million people and waters 3 million acres of farms across the state. And if we are going to move water from the north to the south, we have to move it through this ecologically sensitive area. 
And how we can effectively do that has been the source of political debate for decades. On top of that, if you've been watching the news lately, you might have seen that in America, we're not known for spending enough money maintaining our infrastructure so that it, it, we don't get very high scores in our infrastructure maintenance. And unfortunately, for those of us that rely on these water systems in California, like me, um, our grades for these systems aren't better. So we have the systems that we have not maintained that we're relying on pretty heavily. So that's the status of our, of our system today for water provision. Um, one of our, my research projects was to look at what it might look like in the future. How is the electricity that we need for water supply going to change over time? And we did a study where we looked at reports from 400 water utilities that serve California cities and towns that told us how they plan to get their water in 2030. And then we estimated how much electricity would be needed to provide that water. And for each of California's 10 hydrologic regions shown on this map, we looked at how that compared to the electricity needed and the water provided in 2010. And here's what we found. Um, in 2030, those 2010 projections said we would use 30% less water in our homes. So we're gonna conserve water. And this actually seems like a low estimate after we've been, been through the last drought and we actually conserved 25% in a single year because the governor told us we needed to. Um, however, that water that's delivered, because we're going to need to change the supplies where it comes from, based on 2010 projections, we're expecting that each unit of water delivered is going to require 15% more electricity on average across the state. But there's a great deal of variability in that, so much that in the north, comparing the wet north to the dry south, we expect that electricity intensity to vary by two orders of magnitude. And lastly, because of population and economic growth in the state, overall, we're expecting to need something like 40% more electricity to provide water in the future. And that's a lot, and we need to plan for that. But we also need to think about how we can do better. So one way we can save some of this energy is by using less water. We just talked about the fact that Californians know how to do this in our homes, but there are opportunities for water utilities themselves to do this. Um, you may not know, but we lose about 10% of our treated drinking water and all of the energy embedded in that through pumping and treating out of our underground pipes through leaks and losses. These aren't completely avoidable because we pressurize our water pipes for safety. So water leaks from every seam and pinprick in the pipes. But we, there are ways to do better. And one of the ways we can do that is using controls like the ones shown in the blue circle on this graph that allow us to reduce the pressure in the pipes overnight when very few people need water and to automatically adjust it back up in the morning when we wake up and we want to take showers and we need a lot more water. And that automatic adjustment of pressure reduces how much water is leaking out from all those seams and it can make a substantial difference. So much so that if we strategically use these kinds of systems in areas with older, leaky, high pressure pipes, it's four times cheaper to save water with an, with an intervention like this than it is to provide those rebates on low flow toilets that many California utilities provide. So we need to be looking for opportunities like this. Another way we can save more energy is by thinking smaller. So a lot of the water systems, when we built them 50 to 100 years ago, we designed them so that our treatment systems were as big as we could manage because we knew a lot of our energy was used in those treatment systems and they had very large economies of scale. So we built plants that look like this. And this treatment plant may look familiar to you because this is East Bay Mud's wastewater treatment plant. It's located just south of the entrance to the Bay Bridge and it serves 750,000 people, including the city of Berkeley. But in recent decades, our ability to treat water at smaller scales has been improving pretty quickly. So now we're starting to think about how to minimize the pumping that we rely on to move water around these large systems and how we can do better with that. And um, so we're thinking about how we can provide treatment at smaller scales, like a building or a neighborhood scale to avoid that pumping penalty. So my team did research about how would we compare providing wastewater treatment for the water flows shown in this blue circle, and then also providing water for reuse within a building. And how does that compare on a decentralized scale to a centralized scale? And we set our study in the city of San Francisco. 
And what we found is that in this dark green area in the middle of the map, using existing technology, we can provide wastewater treatment and recycled water for a population as small as 100 people with similar energy requirements as what it would take to do the same services from the centralized systems at the plants shown in the green stars along the coasts. The changing colors coming out from that represent areas where we would need larger and larger systems in order to be competitive with that centralized, centralized approach. But we know that these decentralized treatment processes were not designed particularly for energy efficiency, and there's a lot of room for improvement. So we also looked at what the map would look like if our energy intensity of those treatment systems were reduced by only 20%, which is not a big jump. So we shift the red line on this left graph down by 20%. And when we do that, the map looks a lot different and there's many opportunities to um, implement decentralized systems and gain efficiency improvements across, the, um, across San Francisco. And so we're more and more looking for opportunities to do that. Which brings me to the research that I'm currently working on, which is really focused on prioritizing efficiency and reuse for future water supplies. And I'm doing that work with the National Alliance for Water Innovation, which is based at Berkeley Lab. And NAWI, as we call it, represents the largest single federal investment into clean water technology since the Kennedy administration. Um, and now his goal from DOE, the Department of Energy. Now his goal is to dramatically improve the technology that we use for desalination and reuse, particularly for systems that are operated at smaller scales. And the way we plan to do this is a six prong approach by trying to design systems that are more autonomous, that treat water more precisely, with more resilient infrastructure, with intensified waste management, so reducing both the volumes of our waste products from these treatment processes and trying to reuse materials from them, um, improving the cost and the energy efficiency of modular or smaller systems, and finally by electrifying the system overall, which is a step towards decarbonization. And all of those things we think are going to improve overall energy efficiency and opportunities for reuse in the future um, U.S. circular water economy. And that's it. I'm open to questions. Thank you so much, Jen. That was wonderful and, and really eye-opening. We had um, one question that um, is asking specifically about that 10% water loss in California, that average yeah. number that you had. Is that um, a California average or is that a U.S. national average? Um, this number is admittedly not perfectly documented, but it is a California average. The average estimate for the US is more like 15%. But even in California, it varies a lot. And particularly older systems are more likely to have higher rates of losses than newer ones just because of aging. Mm -hmm. um, but that is specific to California. Okay. And then we just got a question that asks, do water treatment facilities generally use on-site power generation? Um, there are certainly some examples of that. There are some water utilities that have invested a lot in, in say, photovoltaics or other opportunities for um, generating electricity, but it is, I don't, it's by far not the norm. The norm would be using grid electricity. Okay, great. So we are going to, I said I was going to only ask you two, and then we're going to okay. hand, it over, <laughs> hand things over um, to Jen and Julia. And it was what you were wonderful. That was wonderful. It was crazy eye opening. We're so excited to um, to now hear from Julia because I know she has a lot more to say about this subject. So Jen, take it away. Thanks both. And uh, Jen, fantastic presentation. Uh, it is now my pleasure to invite our next speaker, Julia Sinai, to the screen. Julia right now is a PhD student in the Energy and Resources Group at UC Berkeley. She's also a grad student researcher in the Earth and Environmental Sciences area at Berkeley Lab. And if that weren't enough, she is also a researcher at the Pacific Institute. And she studies climate change mitigation and adaptation of the coupled electricity and water sectors in the Western United States, integrating energy and water models to improve climate resilient planning of these interdependent infrastructure systems. Throughout her studies, uh, she's conducted research evaluating policies and technologies to facilitate decarbonization of the power grid with energy storage, demand response, 
and electric vehicles. Prior to her graduate studies, she consulted in the energy and finance sectors and worked at an electric utility in long-term resource planning. She has a Master of Public Policy, an MS in Energy and Resources, and a BA in both Economics and Spanish, all from UC Berkeley, so go Bears. When she's not busy researching the energy water nexus, she likes to bike and hike around the Bay Area. Julia, over to you. Thanks so much, Jen, for the introduction and for having me here today. Um, and thank you to the other Jen for doing a great job getting into the complex ways that electricity and water systems are connected in California. I'm going to build on Jen's talk and describe the impacts that climate change could have on California's energy water nexus. So as Jen explained, electricity and water systems are very closely connected in the dry region of California. Electricity powers all stages of the managed water cycle from supplying and conveying that water, treating it, distributing it to homes and to farms, using that water at homes and farms, and wastewater treatment. As Jen alluded to, a staggering 19% of California's electricity use is related to water, and about half of that is coming from water heating, which is really energy intensive. The connections between the two systems go in the other direction too, as in water is used to power electricity in the form of hydropower, where 15% um, of electricity generation in California comes from hydropower. However, the two systems can be quite vulnerable to climate change. This picture here is of one of the state's largest reservoirs during the most recent drought and foreshadows some of the effects that we could see under climate change. During that drought, the snowpack that as Jen mentioned is a source of a large share of our water storage was the worst point, 6% of average. And because it's also a source for a lot of the hydropower generation, hydropower was on average half of its normal level. So what did we do about it? We had to make up that lost electricity and it came in the form of natural gas, which was not only expensive, but created some more carbon dioxide emissions. So that cost the state about two and a half billion dollars and added 24 million tons of carbon dioxide, which is roughly how much would come from 5 million cars on the road over an entire year. So it's a lot. At the same time, because there was less water available in reservoirs like this, people turned to groundwater and that also increased our energy use for pumping. So all of these effects were going on when I was working at an electric utility before grad school and got me interested in how the two systems are so closely connected and therefore more vulnerable to such impacts. Um, and when I got to grad school, I learned that droughts indeed were more likely to become frequent and more intense under climate change but that that's just one of many possible impacts that climate change could have. So I'm now gonna walk through the most relevant climate change impacts that are projected from the research. First of all, um, projections um, from climate models suggest that on average, maximum daily temperatures could rise six to nine degrees Fahrenheit by the end of the century across the state, um, depending on the future level of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, in terms of precipitation, the research doesn't agree um, as to whether California as a whole is likely to get wetter or drier. However, even without a change in that total amount of precipitation, because of higher temperatures, more of it is likely to fall as rain instead of snow, and that's going to affect that snowpack. So this figure here shows um, the snowpack historically in the far left, which is mainly in the Sierra Nevada. And the range of future snowpack by the 2070 to 2100 timeframe, which could range from a 48 to 65% loss. And in, in addition to the shrinking smoke, snowpack, um, the higher temperatures are also gonna make the snow melt sooner and earlier in the year. And that's gonna affect how we manage our water resources. So this picture here shows um, a schematic or a drawing of how we roughly uh, operate our water system under current conditions. This blue line here um, is runoff, which is basically water on the surface, which comes largely from that melting snow. As the snow melts, it goes to fill reservoirs over the winter and spring, 
and that runoff peaks in the spring and gradually declines. Um, some of that water has to get released in the spring because it's during flood season and we need to save some space in case there's a big storm coming and we wanna prevent flooding. The red line shows the typical pattern of water demand, which is largely driven by agriculture and is therefore peaking in the summer. So that water um, from the reservoirs is used to meet that water demand. And even under current conditions, sometimes there's some shortage by the fall. Because of higher temperatures, making that snow melt earlier in the year, the two curves are essentially gonna move further apart. So snow melt will peak now during the flood season, meaning more of that water will have to get released. Less of it will go into reservoirs. And that means that there will be less water to meet our demands and our shortages are gonna get bigger. So these red and uh, yellow areas are gonna get bigger. And overall, it's gonna get much more complicated to manage our water system, and it's likely gonna affect our water availability. So how do these climate change impacts translate to um, relevant effects for California's water and electricity resources? So as Jen mentioned, the key point for both systems is that supply has to match demand. In other words, they have to stay in balance. But when I looked at the research, there really wasn't a comprehensive analysis of how these many climate change impacts could affect these balances. So with a group of researchers, we looked at what individual studies said, different components, um, how they could change under these climate impacts, and then added them up to see what the total uh, water and energy balance could be by the end of the century. And you might think that the end of the century is not a problem right now and it's too far off, but given that we're talking about such big infrastructure systems that Jen showed on the map, um, it's really a problem for now because they take a really long time to build and change how they operate. So I'm gonna go through how um, the research shows that these different aspects might be uh, affected by climate change, starting with water supply availability. Because of uncertainty in the amount of precipitation and how well those reservoirs might change their operations, um, there's a huge range in what future water supply availability could be, from a decrease of 25% statewide or an increase of 45%. And so the arrows here uh, represent the direction, but also the relative size is the relative magnitude. In terms of water demand, the biggest water demand in the state is for agriculture in the Central Valley. And because uh, higher temperatures mean that soils will get drier, we're gonna need more water for our crops. And so water demand for agriculture in the Central Valley could increase from one to 14%. On the electricity side, the closest connection to the water through this energy water nexus is hydropower. Because of changes in water supply availability and our ability to change our reservoir operations, um, hydropower is expected to decrease anywhere from one to 23% across the state. And lastly, the other major effect of climate change on the electricity system is through air conditioning. As it gets warmer, people who already have air conditioning are gonna use it more often. And then people, especially in coastal areas where they haven't needed it before are likely gonna by air conditioning. You might have already experienced this in the Bay Area where we've seen a lot of heat waves in recent years. So when we add up these effects for the water system and put them in absolute numbers, we could see a range of a shortage in the worst case of 14 million acre feet, or in the best case, a, a surplus of 19 million acre feet. And you can think of that worst case as Illinois' entire annual water use. So it's a lot of water. On the electricity side, in the worst case, we could see a shortage of 42 terawatt hours or at best only six terawatt hours. And that worst case is about equivalent to Kansas's entire annual electricity use. So going forward, I'm gonna talk about how we can deal with such a worst case water shortage and what are the energy impacts of different ways that we deal with the shortage. So how can we adapt to a water shortage? Um, an adaptation is basically a response to a change in the environment or a stressor. And so when I say adaptation, it's an approach that changes the water system somehow to meet a water shortage. So what tools do we have at our disposal? 
we can essentially increase our supplies or decrease our demands. The research suggests that the most common ways to increase our supplies are with desalination, recycled water, or groundwater recharge, which is where we take water during the wet years, store it underground, and then pump it up and use it during dry years. On the water demand side, the most common ways we can adapt are through water conservation in urban areas or in ag areas. And so, for example, here, you can change your fixtures in your house to be more water efficient, and those all decrease our water demand. However, these effects all have very different electricity impacts. And so how much electricity would it take to uh, deal with this worst case water shortage? Under climate change, the electricity system will need to plan for how the water sector deals with this shortage and that added electricity that it could take. For example, desalination and water recycling use a lot of energy, but conserving water also saves energy, especially if it's hot water that we're saving because it's very energy intensive to heat the water. And it also takes energy to move the water, treat it and do wastewater treatment. So because there are physical limits to all of these individual strategies, um, it's likely that we're gonna need some combination of all of them to meet such a big water shortage. So um, in our analysis, we basically came up with two scenarios of different combinations of these uh, water adaptation approaches or strategies um, to meet that water shortage. And we calculated the electricity use that would be required under both scenarios. The first is a conservation focused scenario where we basically max out the amount of physically possible conservation. And then we fill out the rest of the shortage with other new supply options. The other is if we don't conserve and we just do the new supply options from water recycling and desalination. And as you can see, the um, difference is pretty big in the energy usage between the two bars. In this uh, energy intensive supply or the new supply scenario, that's about the equivalent uh, energy use of Nevada's annual electricity usage. Um, however, from the water, uh, so this describes the um, electricity impacts from the water sector, but what's the total impact therefore that the electricity system needs to plan for? It not only needs to plan for these changes from the water sector, but the reduced hydropower and higher air conditioning impacts that I first talked about do directly from climate change. So this picture here is the same one that I showed before, the blue bars are the electricity uh, usage impacts needed to cope with the water shortage under the two different scenarios. And the yellow bar is what is the uh, electricity that needs to be made up to make up for the reduced hydropower and higher uh, air conditioning use. And what you can see from the two bars is that in this conservation scenario, what the water sector does doesn't make a huge impact relative to what the energy sector needs to deal with already. But under the new supply scenario, um, the actions from the water sector could double what the electricity needs to plant, electricity system needs to plan for. And so it highlights, I think, two main things that the two sectors really should coordinate on how they are working on climate change adaptation and also emphasizes the importance of the sort of research that Jen talked about um, to lower the energy usage of these water recycling and desalination options. So in conclusion, what did we find? How, did climate, how may climate change affect California's energy usage? We learned that increasing temperatures, shrinking snowpack and earlier snow melt are projected to impact the two sectors. The most significant impacts are on water supply, which are also quite uncertain and then in air conditioning and hydropower. How we adapt to those worst case water shortage under climate change could have a significant um, effect on electricity use. And so therefore to properly account for climate change, electricity planning must consider the energy water nexus. So with that, I'll stop there and acknowledge my funders and collaborating institutions. And if you wanna learn more, I put a QR code and a link for a great uh, news article that describes the research that I talked about. So thank you so much.
Fantastic, Julia. Thanks so much. That was a great presentation. Um, so we've got a couple questions that we wanted to ask you before we bring Jen and Dee back to the virtual stage. Um, and so first, you know, I, I'd be curious to know how could a more diverse energy portfolio, especially one that incorporates more robust renewables, address some of the vulnerabilities that are caused by climate change? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so first of all, if we have a greener electricity mix, uh, increases in energy use that might come from the water sector will have less of an impact on our overall greenhouse gases um, from electricity use. And I would also say that solar and wind are less sensitive to climate impacts um, than maybe some of our fossil generation, um, which I didn't mention uses quite a bit of water for cooling. So if we shift to more wind and solar, we're gonna lower our dependence on water and be less climate sensitive. Um, and lastly, because hydropower is expected to decrease, it does mean that we'll probably have to build extra wind and solar and storage to make up for those uh, differences. Thanks, Julia. Uh, let me ask you one more. Um, so now that you've developed this framework for evaluating the impacts of climate change on both energy and water systems, what's, what's your next step? How can water resource managers and energy managers take advantage of the findings of your report? Yeah, um, so I'll answer that in two parts. Uh, my personal next step is that I'm working, so this analysis was like a high level statewide analysis, um, but I am now working on a much deeper dive where we're looking at um, how climate change could affect water resources um, across the entire Western US since the system is so connected. For example, California gets a lot of water from the Colorado River and it also gets electricity all the way from the Pacific Northwest and hydropower. And so we're linking this water resources model under climate change when with an electricity model to understand how um, we should plan our future grid when we consider climate change impacts on water. Um, and then in terms of what water and energy managers can do, um, we de developed this framework to be sort of a guide of what specific water and energy managers should do deeper analysis of um, and to get a, an idea of like the comprehensive impact that climate change could have because the size of those individual impacts are really specific to a particular system um, and the climate that they're in. For example, like not, ev not every uh, electric utility is gonna have so much hydropower and uh, different water utilities might have different adaptation options. So. I think it's a good starting point for uh, utilities to think holistically about how climate change could affect their systems and also start some important conversations about um, adaptation options that are available and possible trade-offs and synergies um, and how to coordinate between the two sectors. Awesome, thanks so much, Julia. Um, so let me ask you to stop sharing your screen and I'm gonna invite Dee and Jen back to the stage. And I think you know, your comments about uh, the next phase of, the, of your research kind of segues into some of the other questions that we've gotten from, uh, from our audience. So why don't I start by asking this? Um, and maybe this is something you can both tackle. So what impact does you know, the water shortage in our neighboring mountain states like Colorado, Utah, et cetera, have on California. You know, there, there's this assumption that we're sort of all in this together, that it's Western United States. And we're wondering, you know, how, how can we collectively address this problem that we're all facing? Do you wanna start that one, Julia? Or I can, either sure. way. Uh, yeah, I can try to tackle it. Um, I'm just thinking specifically about Colorado again, um, where uh, at least uh, Southern California gets a pretty large share of its water from the Colorado River. And uh, the Colorado River, Colorado River um, has seen uh, some declines. And uh, for example, Lake Mead, um, which is one of the biggest uh, storage, uh, water storage reservoirs um, in the US, is much lower this year. And so what happens upstream of California does uh, have an effect on how, especially Southern California deals with um, their water supplies. So yeah, and I think 
So I'll, I'll leave it at that and Jen, please. Yeah, that's a, a pretty good summary. The only thing I would add to that is that um, an important thing to understand, and this is true of the Colorado River management as well as generally water management in California is that um, a lot of our water rights that were allocated on these surface water systems are based on um, unrealistic estimates of how much water is available. So we're not only dealing with the fact that there is a drought, but also the fact that even without it, there wasn't as much water as they said, as they kind of allotted to everyone. And historically, California has taken more than their fair share because other people weren't using what they needed and now they need it. So there's sort of multiple things contributing to what's going on on the Colorado River. And all of it means that Southern California is really starting to think about how they can reduce reliance on that um, because they're required to um, as part of that contract. But there, there is kind of systemic thinking as um, Julie was saying about you know, what happens to the entire region because everyone is interconnected. Uh, yeah, and another thing that comes to mind on the electricity side is that recent set of blackouts that we had um, in um, August of last year, I don't remember quite exactly, was a result of a west-wide heat storm. And so it is possible that um, some of the extreme events that California uh, is facing might affect the entire region. And part of the blackouts um, were happening because the state couldn't import electricity from these other regions. So yeah, I think it is a regional problem. So it seems like we are, we're interconnected as you're saying, is there other, st are there other states that are having similar issues that we're having as it relates to kind of this feast or famine or summertime water doesn't exist, right? Distribution of water versus distribution of people and needs um, that we're either learning from or working with, um, you know, it seems like this can't be just a California problem. Um, I think different aspects are being mm -hmm. dealt with by different states, but I also mm -hmm. think California is, um, from what I know, California all really is kind of a veterinarian's <laughs> horse of all the problems. So if you look, I can share my screen for a second. Yeah, uh, people are learning from us lately. <laughs> yes, I think, I mean, internationally, there are other areas, certainly Israel is one um, that has a lot of issues uh, in, that we are learning from. Mm. Um, but hold on, let me... Uh, yeah, please do share this. Oh, that didn't do right. One second. Um, there is, if you look in the US particularly, there is this issue when you talk about the feast or famine issue, this graph um, kind of tells you how rainfall varies from year to year across the US. Um, and you see that California really is in kind of a unique situation in, in terms of that statistic. Like we, the other states just don't experience it the way that we do. Um, and even the seasonal rain, I think, um, this is kind of year to year, but seasonal rain, I think, is a stronger effect in California as well. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. Yeah. We're like a rainbow. Yeah. And entire regions of the, of the part United you States. don't want. <laughs> yeah. Only right. the colors you don't want. <laughs> right. <laughs> I guess we have a little bit of yellow at the top, but. Right. Whereas, like, the other entire, you know, half of the state is the same color. Um, that's very interesting. Wow, I love that. Thanks for sharing. No problem. Yeah, yeah. that's also why it make, it's a lot harder to forecast or project how future precipitation is going to change because there's so much interannual variability or differences in feast or famine that Jen talked about from year to year under current conditions. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, okay, one other question. So uh, we've seen arguments in favor of restoring the Delta that seems to oppose rebuilding the Delta infrastructure. I'm confused about what would that mean about transporting water from North to South? Is there a possible model, model for water use that could avoid moving water through the Delta? That seems like a question for Jen, maybe. Um, I'll certainly start, and um, I will also say that I'm an engineer, not a hydrologist. So some of the some of this is, is a little bit on the edge of my expertise. Um, but my perspective is that um, this is a highly controversial issue, um, and there certainly are arguments that we can um, 
develop local supplies in Southern California and conserve water to the extent that we might not need to do that um, to move the water from north to south. Um, I, I personally am a little skeptical of that because that's a huge amount of water and it takes a long time to develop. And, and one of the risks associated with the Delta is that you know if we had um, a huge earthquake in that area with our current infrastructure, like we would basically lose that all that water in a day. I mean, we don't have a backup <laughs> that we can call on in that time. So, I mean, even, even to use any water, there needs to be some um, kind of redevelopment of that area because it's just too um, risky the way it is right now. So I think in my mind, really the debate is how much do we wanna invest in that? And how much more, if any water, do we wanna pull off of it than we already are, or, or do we want to reduce that rather than do we want to abandon it completely? I, I personally don't think that's a realistic um, option anytime in the near future. Um, but I think there are people who will make up the opposite case and, it, and it's really expensive to do it. So we don't want to underestimate kind of the arguments against it, but it's a big challenge. And I'm not sure how we deal with it without moving some of the water, even um, there are people who talk a lot about the opportunities to store water underground rather than above ground in our reservoirs using our aquifers that we've depleted to store water. And one of the problems there is that even those aquifers are largely below the delta. So it doesn't avoid most of that water transfer. We would still need to make it and we would need to make much larger transfers in wet years than in dry years. In our current system, it's just not built for that kind of like ramping up and down. Mm. Um, so there's just some mm -hmm. problems that I personally don't think we can avoid dealing with. Mm -hmm. If you have so, a different perspective, Julia, I'd love yeah, to hear it. Yeah, I was going to say, Julia. Yeah, uh, I largely agree. Um, I do think I do think that there is a push in Los Angeles to try to limit the dependence on import imported water from the north or from Colorado, um, and a push to do a lot more recycling of water and relying on stormwater. Um, and so they are thinking of solutions uh, to, to lower their risk and diversify, but um, it's a big challenge. The last thing I'll add is that that, that, adapt that adjustment to these more new supplies are, are typically a lot more expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and so we see big cities with a lot of resources making that adjustment, but that is going to leave a lot of our small communities and our ag communities um, without alternatives. So I think there's an equity concern here that um, we need to think about. That makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Jen and Julia. You know, since we're talking about moving water around the state, uh, we got a question from one of our attendees uh, about the peripheral canal. You know, as we're talking about, as we're talking about this, you know, has there been any effort to reconsider something like the peripheral canal as a solution? Um, can I back up and give a little? Um, background on the peripheral canal because I some people may not be familiar. That would be helpful. Yeah, thanks. With this. Um, one second. I have a slide on this too. I teach a class on California water, so I have a lot of slides to help discuss these things. Um, so we'll look at this map. Um, so peripheral prepared. canal. Um, the peripheral canal is a, a, a response to this issue of the delta, um, and um, there's a the newer version is called water fix. It's actually tunnels and not canals. We have, um, you know, Jerry Brown, our, our last governor was governor twice. The first time he was a good governor, he proposed these peripheral canals, which were just canals kind of avoiding the most ecologically sensitive part of the Delta, kind of move water around that um, and, and repair this issue we have with, with our Delta conveyance. Um, and then when he became governor the second time, he reframed that as the water fix and this became a tunnel two tunnels originally, there's debate about whether it should be one or two that connect much higher up. Our current pumps are located here in black at the bottom of this gray figure on this slide. Um, and it would move them way higher up closer to Sacramento so we can get fresher water with less risk of um, reliability. And, and we're doing our pumping in an area where in theory, at least it will have lower impact on fish and other um, kind of ecological concerns that we have deeper in, into the Delta. Um, super expensive and lots of feelings about, um, you know, if we built this system to 
collect a lot of water from our northern communities and sending it south, you know, it's proposed, it was sold as we'll take that water in wet years so that we don't have to take as much in dry years. But I think that there is a historical um, pattern that we just take all we can get. And so people were very concerned about having that increased capacity to take more water. So lots of pros and cons around that. Um, the, the state pulled their permit request from the state water board to approve this new um, configuration in 2019. Um, and the new governor, um, Gavin Newsom, um, since then has um, released kind of an alternative, well, it's not really an alternative approach, a different framing of our water issues, again, um, which he refers to as the water resilience portfolio. It was released um, not quite a year ago. It's a little bit more broad in terms of its scope for dealing with water issues and addresses a lot of these um, issues around ecological health. And not that the past governor didn't include those things, but they just weren't quite as um, clearly laid out. But even in this plan, there is a recognition that we're gonna need to deal with the Delta and, and it discusses tunnels, but there hasn't been as much political will and political capital expended on that option, at least so far in his administration. And so to that, I'm, I think that kind of answers the, the question around peripheral canals but I can go into it more if I need to. And Thanks, Julia, please, please add. Yeah. That was a great response. Okay. I'll, we, I'll we, leave it at that. We got a thank you from the person okay. who asked it. <laughs> so, so let's pivot the conversation a little bit. You know, you both talked about water conservation as a tactic. Um, this was a question that I had in my mind, so I'm glad one of our audience members asked this as well. Uh, is storage and use of gray water or rainwater in households a useful solution? And could that be transferable to, you know, being implemented at larger scales? Julie, yeah, do you want um, to start? <laughs> yeah, I guess I can start. I, I think this is slightly more Jen's area, but um, I would say that um, we kind of have to have all hands on deck and think about a portfolio or a suite of solutions and because there isn't one magic bullet. There's only so much that we can conserve. Um, and California has already been decreasing its per capita water usage uh, and um, the trend is continuing in that, and we did a great job during the drought, as Jen mentioned, to reduce 25% of urban water use. Um, so there are some limits to conservation. And so, yeah, I do think that some of these more creative solutions that are decentralized could be really helpful to supplement. I don't know. I haven't done an analysis of the potential size or like magnitude of how much the actual potential is out there compared to conservation, but um, I think it would help this whole movement to more local water and decentralized water, and again, rel decrease reliance on imports that are very energy intensive. Yeah, I'll just double click on everything Julia just said, um, but only add that when you talk about using gray water, either at households or um, or the centralized scale, that really is a very similar approach that I talked about us applying in San Francisco, because that analysis, gray water is basically showers and laundry water. It's water that doesn't have organic material in it. So when we did that, the analysis we did, we really looked at including that with all of the other wastewater. So it's a similar approach. So there certainly are opportunities to do that. And that, that analysis kind of gets at some of the, the issues there. Now, rainwater is a little different. And the part of it is because of the particularities of California. Um, I think it's a great option other places, but because of our rain patterns that we get it all in six months, if you're gonna effectively store all that water when it's raining until you actually need it months later, the cost of your storage at a household level is, is cost prohibitive. It's super, super more expensive than any other supply we've talked about today to do that at a household level. Feel free, it's a great educational opportunity. It's a great awareness. There are other reasons to do it um, like avoiding flooding or, or um, slope stability type issues. There are reasons to do it, but for water supply, it doesn't really make sense in California, at least not in the lower thir two thirds of the state, but there are um, cities and, and LA is one of them 
really looking at um, doing centralized collection of, we call it stormwater when it's at that centralized level and collecting that. And largely it's using it for groundwater recharge. That's, and in the Central Valley, they're looking at it. They're looking at that lots of places. So that's um, definitely still on the table um, in California. Great, thanks, Jen. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, you know, um, we got a couple of questions for you, Jen, specifically around the work you did in San Francisco. So I'd love to get a little bit more detail about that. The first question we got was, uh, you know, have there been other cities where this kind of decentralized work is being done? Um, and then the second is, can you talk a little bit more about the factors that made some parts of the city better for decentralization than others? I can. Um, I'm not going to go back to the slide unless um, people think I need to, but um, I'll start with the second question, like what were the factors um, in San Francisco? They really come down to the distance from the existing wastewater treatment plant um, longer. The more you would have to pump the recycled water back, the, the more beneficial local treatment is. Um, it, and then elevation for similar reasons. The higher it is, the more you want to do it locally. And then population density. When you have a lot of people close together, you can really save a lot of on those pipes and pumps treating it locally than if they're spread out more. So that central part of San Francisco that's at very high elevation um, was the best option. Um, and then those patterns I think would repeat in other places. Now, if there are other cities thinking about um, these kind of approaches, I will say San Francisco is to my knowledge, the lead on this. Um, they in fact chaired a national blue ribbon commission looking at these options across the, the, the nation. Um, and they have policies in place to support it that I have that I don't know exist anywhere else um, or didn't pretty recently. Um, but there are certainly other cities looking at it, and it, it makes sense. It's not it's not a San Francisco specific solution. It, there are certainly are um, many, particularly of our larger cities, that are thinking about um, supplementing their existing infrastructure with this kind of approach for various reasons. There are systems like this in New York City. There are colleges that have implemented systems like this. Um, it's certainly not unique to San Francisco. So um, it sounds like that there's either a teacher or parents in the um, audience, which is so great. They're asking about their students. So if a high school student wanted to work on a project possibly in conjunction with local government, scientists, what sort of project? do you think would be the most effective uh, sort of small local project that they could work for? I don't know if you're, if you're familiar with any citizen science projects or again with the local governments. And then the follow-up to that was, um, it doesn't need to be a single project, maybe multiple. I don't know, are you guys familiar with anything? I wonder if Julia, as someone from campus, might be more familiar with some of these resources. I honestly don't know of kind of a clearinghouse for those kind of opportunities. I think they do come up, mm -hmm. but um, I might have to, um, I'm happy yeah. to get back to somebody with more information, but I don't have that right now. So probably yeah. just, yeah, go ahead, Julia. Uh, yeah, I don't know of specific uh, like project lists either, but I think that there are some programs that connect the campus with uh, scientists, uh, sorry, scientists on campus with uh, high schools around the Bay Area to mm -hmm. do some uh, interactive science workshops, but I'm not sure about. Okay, and then a, a second follow-up. Um, if a group were to advocate for something in their city, maybe stormwater collection or changing building codes, what direction would you advocate? So that's a good, this probably is for anyone, right? So if you were to go to your county or city leaders, what should folks be advocating for? I think for me, conservation, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I know that we've talked that there are limits, but um, any incentives to limit your outdoor watering um, as well as your indoor watering, I mean, uh, indoor watering, indoor water use. Because um, uh, as we saw in, in our work that um, especially hot water is super energy intensive. And um, so the amount of water that we use, whether that means better mm -hmm. fixtures, building codes, um, keep, 
uh, doubling down on those efforts. Um, yeah, and I think there's also a movement towards electrifying our water heaters, which I didn't get at earlier. A lot of the, the majority of water heating in the state is from natural gas. And so we not only have a high energy usage, but a high greenhouse gas uh, impact from how much we heat water. So um, programs that support a shift in uh, our water heating to electric, that would be great. And with an eye on equity as well. Um, okay, lovely. Um, so, um, Jen, you mentioned that NAWI is developing capabilities to address the technical barriers and research needed to create a stable water supply. Can you describe how these capabilities might help us address other challenges, for example, wildfires devastating the states and things like that? that um, <laughs> I to think um, specifically mm -hmm. about wildfires. I think um, anytime we take pressure off of our, our freshwater resources, then that's going to leave water in the local environment available for that kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if we don't, there's, there's a lot of connections between, say, you know, how much water's in a river and how much water's available in the groundwater locally. And then all of that mm -hmm. is in, then in, connected to how dry the trees are when right. it comes to fire season. Um, so, so these are really complex uh, connections that aren't just about how the infrastructure and kind of these systems that Julie and I have been talking about, but are really about how this hydrologic system works together more globally that, that are, um, man, that's, that's more than an hour talk in and of itself. So <laughs> um, the answer is yes, for many, many, many reasons. Okay, you you also mentioned um, that there's a 30% a prediction of, of saving in homes specifically, right? Um, and I'm, folks are wondering, is that from personal choice, personal changes, or is that mandate? So are city and county governments planning on, or state governments planning on implementing water restrictions year round, or not year round, every year? Um, where, how does that 30% come to be? So there, um, I don't think we expect kind of the kind of mandate that we saw during the last drought, these emergency mandates, that's mm -hmm. not really what we're talking about. But there are um, regulations that require the state to increasingly move towards um, conservation. The most recent one is called conservation is a way of life um, for California. And um, they do kind of put the onus on the water utilities to help kind of guide their customers towards um, reducing their water consumption. And a lot of that is through programs like rebates and education and, uh, and um, that, yeah, that kind of thing. So um, I believe that the current standard, I hope I get this right, is that at least for indoor water use, the state average, the utilities have to average something like, um, 55 gallons per capita per day in 2025, and then 50 by 2030. Um, and I don't actually, I should know what the indoor average is. Julia, do you know that right now? I'm guessing that it's um, maybe more like 60 mm -hmm. um, right now. It's changed a lot in the last few years. Mm -hmm. It went down with the drought. It's bounced back up a little bit, but not as much as it was. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't know the current number, but there are there are regulations in place, but they're not enforced by the at the customer level. They're enforced at the utility level. I see. So, oh, oh, I was going to say, Julie, do you have anything to add? I don't know. If yeah, the, I think the indoor use is around 55 or 60 uh, currently. But in terms of total per capita use, it does vary pretty widely across the state because of outdoor uh, watering and the density of homes. Mm -hmm. um, so it's important to think about the total number as well. Yeah, there are regulations around that too, but they're specific to the community they're in because they take into account those kind of local factors. Makes sense. Thanks both. Um, so we've got one more question and then I think we might wrap up because we're getting close to 115. And this question is uh, for Julia. Somebody wanted to know that in your research, um, did you consider changes to groundwater levels under future climate scenarios? Uh, yeah, so those ranges, the big ranges that I 
presented of future water su supply availability, we're incorporating all inflows of water into the system, um, but they were probably a simplified analysis of how much uh, surface water would be going into recharge groundwater. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's a lot of room for future research, especially since um, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act was enacted to um, limit our groundwater use to sustainable levels. Um, and so I think that'll have a big impact on the amount of groundwater use in the state and the overall portfolio of water. Um, it remains to be seen how it's gonna play out. Um, and that's, I, I believe, supposed to be binding by 2045. Is that right, Jen? That we need to, to get our uh, groundwater to sustainable levels. Um, so yeah, that's an interesting area of future research that I am looking at for my Pacific Institute work as well. But um, yeah, the, in summary, the, the numbers that I presented do incorporate groundwater, but um, not in great detail. Thanks. And Jen, did you have something to add there? Or? Okay. And we got one last question. So I'm going to ask this before we before we do really wrap up. Um, so I think this is something we'd be interested to hear from both of you. Uh, do you think efforts to measure water consumption more precisely, you know, like smart water efforts will help? And are these being worked on right now? Um, yes. <laughs> uh the uh on both accounts yes and yes the uh there's a fair bit of research that says that we can really leverage things like competitiveness among neighbors um to drive we saw i think we saw this in energy consumption and have seen it in some pilot um e examples of kind of smart water approaches um i'm actually i actually get that kind of data at my house i'm part of a pilot in east bay mud um which is kind of cool, but um, it's not, yeah, it's not widespread at this point. I do think we're going to see uh, a large advancement in applying things like internet of things approaches and data centered approaches to the water sector um, in the next few years. We're just, they're really rolling out right now. Um, so I, I think we will see that as a sort of an, a, primarily, I think, a tool for education, but um, we will see more and more of that. Thanks. Julie, any, anything to add? Yeah, I, I agree on the yes and the yes. Uh, <laughs> and that, uh, yeah, um, showing your energy usage compared to your neighbors, for example, through the use of smart meters or like compared to an efficient home has been shown to um, create these social norms and social pressure to conserve electricity. And I think that um, those would also be quite successful if we had the water data to um, do the same thing. And yeah, um, the more data that we have at our disposal, the, the better we can target solutions and um, track how we're doing. Um, so I, I think that there's a lot of room for improvement and, and also, um, sharing information between the two sectors, like how much energy usage uh, does a water utility use or um, such information like that would be really so useful for an electricity planner to anticipate how much future energy use that they should build their system to accommodate. Definitely, thanks both. I'll also okay. add just one quick thing, which sure. is that one of the advantages of that kind of approach in water that, that is more dramatic than we see in energy is that in homes, often the biggest source of, of water consumption is in leaks when they're present. They're not present a lot, but when we have them, they're significant. And so anything that can get us um, more real-time data on, look out, there's a leak you need to find, is going to make a big difference in water consumption for the people that are affected. So I think that's going to be a driver for this kind of um, approach as well. Not just the education and competition, but just knowing you have a problem quickly. That hits close to home for us. We had a tiny, tiny water leak and discovered it 
too late and it, it was definitely a painful, painful experience. So anyway, um, we, uh, we have come to another end of a Midday Science Cafe. And before we close, I just wanna thank Julia and Jen one more time for their presentations. And I also wanna thank the audience for tuning yep. in and asking such great questions. Um, if you'd like to stay up to date on research coming out of either of our institutions, you saw in the beginning, we are on social media. You can visit us on our websites, uh, scienceatcal.berkeley.edu and uh, lbl.gov. And with that, let me say thanks again and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, everyone. I second everything Jen said too. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming.